Kagiri was an ugly pathetic loner born with an ability so powerful that he could easily solo Goku. Until one day he gets transferred into another world where he protects a girl just so he could get laid. However, before any of this, a young boy walks through a military base where bodies are falling everywhere, but he doesn't seem to mind. He is the reason for all the chaos. His focus is on finding a woman named Asaka. After some time, he spots her being held at gunpoint by an unknown person. Asaka is shocked to see him, surprised that he made it into the base. The person holding her hostage threatens to harm her if the boy, named Yagiri, comes closer. But Yagiri simply stares at the man. And then, suddenly, Asaka's captor falls dead. Asaka is confused and doesn't understand how Yagiri managed to do this, but she's relieved to be safe. Yagiri is just glad that he has found her. Later, Yagiri wakes up, not by Asaka, but by another girl shaking him to wake him up. Her name is Danara. When he asks what's wrong, she's amazed that he managed to sleep through a big incident. Looking around, there are dead bodies on the bus, and Danara has no idea what to do next. When they step outside, they notice a strange tail moving. Yagiri casually throws a microphone at one of the creatures that attacked his classmate. This action hits a wyvern, and it reacts in a weird way, charging at them. Danara thinks they are doomed because the creature is so powerful, and they can't fight it. Desperate, Danara presses up against Yagiri, which gets him to care just enough to take action. Yagiri calmly speaks, and the wyvern falls dead. Danara is puzzled and has no idea how he did it. Afterward, Yagiri takes out a video game to help calm her down, but she gets frustrated, saying it's not the time to play games. She asks if he doesn't want to leave the bus, but Yagiri isn't in a rush, unsure if it's even safe outside. Although Danara understands, she urges him to take the situation more seriously. Yagiri agrees and asks her to explain what happened. Danara tells him that they were on a normal field trip, riding the bus, when they entered a tunnel and came out into a sunny meadow. At first, it was a nice but confusing surprise. Then, a woman named San boarded the bus, introducing herself as a sage. She seemed friendly at first, but when the teacher asked what was happening, San killed him by blasting his head off. Sion explained that she had summoned them into this world because she needed new sages, the rulers of this land. She said they had one month to become sages, or they would die. Sion gave most of the students a special ability called a gift and installed a system called Battle Song in their body, which included a status window. However, Danara didn't receive one of these gifts, so she had no idea what the status window looked like. When she asked about it, Sion dismissed her, saying some people just aren't suitable for magical powers. Without a gift, Danara is doomed to be nothing more than a common person, or worse, livestock in this world. After that, Sion announced that a dragon would soon attack them, and the students should try not to die during the quest. Danara's friend looked at the screen that had information about the dragon, and they were all frightened about what was coming. One of the students then suggested that the class should work together and figure out what their powers are so they could make a plan. They wrote down their abilities and came up with a strategy. However, Danara, who didn't have any powers, couldn't participate in the plan. There were three others in the class without powers as well, including a boy named Shinazaki and another named Kuriwu. Kagiri was one of them too, though he spent the entire time sleeping and didn't notice anything that was going on. As the students with gifts finished writing their plans, they decided to leave the weaker ones behind. Shinazaki asked the stronger students to protect them, but the leader of the gifted group said it would be a burden to protect those without powers. The class agreed, deciding to use the powerless students as bait in their fight against the dragon. To make things worse, one student used her powers to cast a charm that made the powerless students more attractive, increasing their chances of being targeted by the dragon. That was easy. The gifted students then left the bus, leaving Danara and the others to fend for themselves. Danara tried waking Yagiri up again, but even though the dragon had already arrived and was attacking, Yagiri remained asleep. Eventually, he woke up and realized the danger they were in. Instead of panicking, he wondered how he would charge his video game in this world where there were no outlets. He thought that there was only one dragon in the area, so he figured it would be safe to go outside now that the creature was dead. Yagiri doesn't seem too worried, even though Danara is in full panic mode. Before they leave, Danara hesitantly asks Yagiri if he had done something to the dragon earlier, as she still can't believe what happened. Yagiri responds casually, saying that he simply told the dragon to die. Danara finds this hard to believe, given how unbelievable it sounds, but she doesn't push it further. Despite her lingering doubts, Yagiri steps out of the bus with a calm demeanor. As they assess their situation, they notice three potential places they could go, a nearby hill, a city in the distance, or a dense forest. However, they realize that entering an unfamiliar forest unprepared could be dangerous, so they hesitate before making a decision. Just as they're about to discuss their next steps, Danara spots something flying toward them from a distance. Alarmed, she points it out to Yagiri, who wonders if it's another dragon. 
As the figures come closer, however, they realize it's not a dragon at all but three of their classmates, Higashida, Fukuhara, and Hanakawa. Danara is surprised to see them, especially after they had abandoned her and the other giftless students. Yagiri, on the other hand, remains unfazed and asks bluntly if he should kill them to avoid trouble. Danara quickly stops him, insisting that they should at least hear them out first before resorting to any violence. However, Yagiri reminds her that these classmates had left the giftless students to die earlier, which doesn't exactly make them good people. Danara, while still uncomfortable with the idea of killing anyone, admits that Yagiri may have a point. Despite this, she hopes they can avoid violence if possible. As the classmates land, they are shocked to see the dragon's corpse lying nearby and realize that Danara, whom they had planned to leave behind, is still alive. It becomes clear from their conversation that they had sinister intentions toward her. They openly admit, without hesitation, that their plan was to turn her into a zombie and do unspeakable things to her. They reveal all of this in front of Danara, making it clear that they had never intended to help her in the first place. At this point, Danara starts to understand that Yagiri may have been right all along. These classmates aren't good people, and their plans for her were cruel and twisted. Her resistance to killing them begins to weaken as she realizes just how dangerous they are. Higashida, one of the classmates, steps forward and demonstrates his power by launching a massive fireball. The fireball is so strong that it not only melts through the bus but also blasts into the mountain behind them, leaving a giant hole. He arrogantly declares that in this world, he can do whatever he wants, and the first thing on his list is to hurt Danner. The other two classmates, Fukuhara and Hanakawa, have also been waiting for an opportunity to harm her. Danner is paralyzed with fear, overwhelmed by the thought of what they might do to her. But Yagiri, as calm as ever, tells her to relax and assures her that he'll take care of the situation. He looks at Higashida and, without hesitation, tells him to die. The others laugh, thinking Yagiri is just saying something ridiculous, but their laughter quickly fades when Higashida suddenly collapses to the ground, lifeless. Fukuhara and Hanakawa are left in shock, unable to comprehend what just happened. Danara, too, is stunned, struggling to understand how Yagiri's simple words had such a devastating effect. Yagiri explains to them that he told Higashida to die, and that's exactly what happened. When Fukuhara tries to move toward his fallen comrade, Yagiri warns him not to move. Fukuhara, ignoring the warning, moves anyway, and Yagiri tells him to die as well. Just like Higashida, Fukuhara collapses, dead before he even hits the ground. Now, only Hanakawa remains, trembling with fear. Yagiri turns his attention to Hanakawa and calmly tells him that if he moves, he'll meet the same fate as the others. Yagiri then begins to explain his power in more detail. He tells Hanakawa that his ability allows him to kill anyone instantly, just by thinking about it. If he decides that someone should die, they will, without any exceptions. Hanakawa, horrified by this revelation, is barely able to process what he's hearing. He tries to argue that Yagiri's power is too unfair, far too powerful for anyone to have. But Yagiri remains indifferent, seeing no need to justify himself. To further demonstrate his ability, Yagiri instructs Hanakawa to check the bodies of his fallen comrades. Hanakawa, using his healing powers, tries to revive Higashida and Fukuhara, but his abilities have no effect. No matter how strong his healing powers are, they can't bring back the dead. Hanakawa begins to panic, realizing that there is no coming back from what Yagiri has done. Frustrated, he accuses Yagiri of going too far, but Yagiri calmly points out that he was merely defending Danara from their evil intentions. They had come here to harm her, and he wasn't going to let that happen. Yagiri further explains that his power not only allows him to kill instantly, but he can also sense when someone has the intent to harm him. This means that if anyone even thinks about trying to kill him, he can detect their intent and act before they can do anything. Combining both abilities makes Yagiri practically untouchable. Hanakawa, realizing the sheer hopelessness of his situation, breaks down in tears. He knows now that there's no way to win against Yagiri, no matter how hard he tries. Desperate to save himself, Hanakawa tries to explain that this isn't the first time they've been summoned to this world. He reveals that some time ago, he and a group of classmates were summoned by magicians from the kingdom to defeat the demon lord. They spent about a year in this world fighting battles and going on adventures. After finally defeating the demon lord, they were returned to earth. However, when they arrived back home, they discovered that only a few hours had passed since they had been summoned. No one even noticed they had been gone. Yagiri, upon hearing this, realizes that there might be a way for them to return to earth. However, he still sees Hanakawa as a threat and raises his hand, preparing to kill him to prevent any future problems. Hanakawa, in a last-ditch effort to save himself, pulls out a rare item, a slave collar. This collar forces the wearer to obey the commands of the first person they see. Hanakawa puts the collar on, 
making himself a slave to Danara, hoping this will earn him some mercy. However, Danara doesn't want to deal with Hanakawa either, so she quickly passes control over to Yagiri. Now bound to Yagiri's will, Hanakawa has no choice but to follow his commands. Yagiri decides not to kill him right away but orders him to go into the dangerous forest nearby, filled with magical beasts, and wait. <laughs> He also instructs Hanakawa to leave behind all the valuable items he had collected from his previous adventures. Hanakawa, now under the influence of the collar, is forced to drop everything and follow Yagiri's orders. As Hanakawa walks off, Danara wonders if Yagiri might be going too far by taking all of his belongings and leaving him in such a deadly forest. However, Yagiri argues that Hanakawa isn't their friend and could betray them at any moment. It's better to keep him out of the way for now. Danara, still somewhat unsure, accepts his reasoning. Danara then asks why Yagiri is sticking with her, especially since she could betray him at some point. Yagiri, surprisingly unconcerned, replies that if it happens, it happens. He chose to trust her, and he's fine with that. Danara blushes at his words, feeling a mix of embarrassment and surprise. She then asks why he's going to such lengths to protect her, even though they barely know each other. Yagiri doesn't have a clear answer, though he jokes that it might be because of her looks. Danara, now completely flustered, accuses him of only caring about her body, which makes her even more embarrassed. Meanwhile, in another part of the world, Sion is lying in bed, feeling quite pleased with herself. Someone named Yuichi enters the room to give her a report on the students she summoned. He informs her that they successfully completed their first mission, but there were four casualties. Sion assumes that the fatalities were from the students who didn't receive gifts. But Yuichi corrects her, saying that two of the dead were actually S-rank students with powerful gifts. This news surprises Sion, as she hadn't expected anyone of that level to die. However, she isn't too concerned and tells Yuichi to handle the situation however he sees fit. Yagiri and Danara finally make it to the city gates after several hours of walking. As they approach, they notice the guards are in the process of closing the gates for the night. Yagiri expected this since it's getting late, so they rush over, trying to get the guards' attention before they get locked out. Danara, eager to handle the situation, steps forward and speaks to one of the guards, but they don't seem to understand a word she's saying. Frustrated but still calm, they are escorted inside and asked to wait under a tent while the guards go to fetch someone who can communicate with them. After a few moments, a man named Masahiko arrives, looking annoyed that he's still being bothered this late. Much to Danara's relief, Masahiko speaks fluent Japanese and already seems to have an idea of what's going on. He explains that the rest of their classmates had come through the town earlier that day, and he'd already dealt with them. Normally, he would charge a toll to let them into the city, but he's received clear instructions from Sion not to hinder any of the sage candidates, so he won't be charging them tonight. Curious about the mention of other sage candidates, Yagiri asks Masahiko where they had gone. Recalling that they were heading to the capital, Yagiri inquires about the direction. However, while Masahiko isn't allowed to get in their way, there's no incentive for him to help them either. Sensing that they aren't going to get much more information, Yagiri prepares to leave. As they pass by, Masahiko takes a long look at Danner and crudely offers her a stay at his mansion for the night, hinting at far less honorable intentions. Danara, horrified, grabs Yagiri's hand and quickly drags him away, her face pale with fear. She may not have liked the guy, but what really scared her was the thought that Yagiri might kill him for what he said. Yagiri, puzzled, wonders why she would think he's the kind of person to do something like that, though, considering he did kill their classmates for merely moving, he realizes it isn't so far-fetched. To ease the tension, Danara changes the subject, pointing out how amazing the town looks. She's especially fascinated by the presence of beast folk wandering the streets. As they walk, they are approached by a friendly-looking cat girl named Mairyu. She can immediately tell that they're new to town and offer her assistance, asking if they need help with anything. Yagiri, naturally suspicious, asks what she stands to gain from helping them. Mairyu doesn't hesitate to reveal her intentions. She wants to get along with all the sage candidate boys because they're all down bad and dying of thirst. She admits that her plan is to cozy up to one of the successful candidates and enjoy an easy life. Danara, though not entirely agreeing with Mairyu's logic, appreciates her honesty. Mairyu assures Danara she has nothing to worry about, promising not to attempt seduction on anyone who already has a girlfriend. She's well aware of how dangerous jealous girls can be. With that out of the way, Danara, still wanting to explore the town before nightfall, agrees to let Mairyu guide them around. Yagiri remains cautious but figures there's no harm in seeing the town with a guide. After all, what's the worst that could happen? It's not like this is a trap, but it was a trap. After spending the evening shopping and enjoying the sights, they find themselves surrounded by a group of thugs. The thieves demand money, but it's clear they're not just after gold. They have their sights set on the talentless sage candidates like Yagiri and Danara. 
The thieves reveal that they're fed up with all the chaos caused by the gifted candidates who regularly cause destruction with their powers, leaving the weak to suffer. Frustrated and unable to fight the powerful candidates directly, they take their anger out on the weak ones. Yagiri, trying to avoid escalation, offers to pay them off. The thieves, though tempted by the money, make it clear they want more than just gold. They plan to kill Yagiri and enjoy Danner afterward. Now fully aware of their intentions, Yagiri decides there's no avoiding what comes next. Danner, sensing the danger, pleads with Mairyu to call off the attack, warning that someone will definitely die if they continue. Mairyu, confident in her plan, dismisses the warning. She can't believe someone without a gift like Yagiri could pose any real threat. With no other choice, Yagiri makes his move. He starts by taking out the five thugs standing directly behind him. They drop to the ground, dead without a sound. The remaining thieves stare in horror as they realize something is very, very wrong. Yagiri then decides to show some restraint. Well, at least as much as he's capable of. Instead of outright killing the next thug, he half kills him, leaving the man in a vegetative state. Danara watches in shock, knowing Yagiri was still holding back despite the extreme results. Mairyu, now realizing she's in way over her head, tries to beg for her life. She spins a sob story about needing money to care for her sick brother, but Yagiri isn't moved. He coldly reminds her that she tried to sell them into slavery, so she's not exactly deserving of a redemption arc. He turns to her and the last remaining thief, tells them to die, and waits for the inevitable. At first, nothing happens, and they breathe a sigh of relief, thinking they've been spared. However, just as they begin to run away, the death sentence kicks in. Mairyu drops dead, followed quickly by the last thief. Danara, stunned by how it all played out, turns to Yagiri and asks why he chose to let them go. Yagiri, still calm, simply says he didn't. His kill rate is always 100%. It just took a bit longer for them to die. The two of them stand in silence for a moment, the grim reality of Yagiri's power sinking in. As for the last guy, well, no one really cares about him, just another nameless NPC. After the battle concludes and the attackers are dead, Yagiri and Danara begin to make their way out of the area. However, before they can get far, the city's guards stop them. The guards received news of a highly unusual request for a large number of coffins from the local mortician, which raised suspicions about recent events. Naturally, they want to ask a few questions. Yagiri, trying to avoid further trouble, attempts to lie his way out of the situation. He claims that he stumbled upon the attackers already dead in the forest. Unfortunately for him, his lie doesn't work. The guard captain, Edelgard, isn't convinced at all. She reveals that she had seen the entire incident unfold and watched as the attackers mysteriously dropped dead just before they could make their move on Danara. Frustrated, Danara can't believe that Edelgard and her guards are treating them as if they were criminals. They were the ones who were attacked, after all. She questions Edelgard, asking why, if she had been watching the whole time, she didn't step in to help when it was clear they were in danger. Edelgard explains that the guards were trying to track down the attackers and find out who their boss was. Their plan had been to let Yagiri and Danara get kidnapped so they could follow the attackers to their leader. Edelgard also informs them that the city guards are under the protection of a sage, which means that any special abilities sage candidates might possess wouldn't work on them. She warns them to come quietly if they don't want to cause any problems. However, one of Edelgard's subordinates uses an appraisal ability to check Yagiri and Danara's ability. To his surprise, neither of them seems to have any sage-related powers. This puzzles the guards, as they can't figure out how Yagiri managed to defeat the attackers so effortlessly. With no evidence or proper explanation, they have no grounds to arrest Yagiri or Danara. Reluctantly, Edelgard admits defeat and tells them they are free to go. Her subordinate apologizes for his commander's behavior, but Yagiri doesn't seem bothered. Instead, he takes the opportunity to ask if they can be compensated with a place to stay for the night. The guard, feeling guilty for the misunderstanding, agrees and arranges for them to stay at an upscale inn. When they arrive at the inn, Danara is completely amazed by the luxurious surroundings. Everything from the decor to the furniture is beyond what she's used to. As they walk through the halls, Yagiri casually suggests that they share a room. His nonchalant tone catches Danara off guard, and she finds herself embarrassed by the idea. Feeling a little flustered, she declines. Yagiri, sensing her discomfort, then offers to book rooms right next to each other, to which Danara agrees. Once in her room, Danara can't help but marvel at the comfort and elegance of the space. The bed is huge and soft, and the room is filled with lavish details. As she lies on the bed, her mind drifts back to Yagiri's earlier suggestion about sharing a room. She wonders why he would even suggest such a thing. Could he have been thinking something inappropriate? Then again, Yagiri has always been by her side ever since they arrived in this world. Without him, she would likely be dead or enslaved by now. Maybe there's more to his suggestion than meets the eye. She starts to question whether he has feelings for her, but she quickly reminds herself that Yagiri has shown more interest in her body than her emotions. Suddenly, 
Her thoughts are interrupted by a strange noise. She looks up and sees a ghostly figure floating above her bed. At first, she's terrified, but as she takes a closer look, she realizes that the ghost bears a striking resemblance to her sister. But that doesn't make sense. Her sister is still alive. That's when it dawns on her. This must be their family's guardian spirit, Moko. The spirit, however, wastes no time and makes it clear that she has no desire to associate with Danara's sister. She is here to help Danara, as her situation has become quite dangerous. Still confused and slightly annoyed, Danara demands to know why Moko didn't help her earlier when she was facing serious life or death situation. Where was Moko when the dragon attacked? Or when she was nearly sold into slavery, twice? Moko, surprisingly honest, admits that she's absolutely terrified of Yagiri. As powerful as Yagiri is, Moko fears that if she were to appear in front of him without proper preparation, he could erase her from existence in an instant. Even though she's already a spirit, the thought of facing Yagiri's wrath scares her beyond belief. Because of this, Moko asks Danara to inform Yagiri about her presence before she shows herself to him. She wants to avoid being seen as a threat. Danara, still a bit skeptical, agrees to tell Yagiri about Moko the next day. Moko then reveals that she's been helping Danara behind the scenes for a while now. For example, Moko was responsible for preventing the sage's battle song ability from being implanted into Danara during their previous encounter. Hearing this, Danara becomes furious. She feels that Moko's actions have put her at a serious disadvantage in this world. But Moko defends her decision, explaining that she assumed Danara wouldn't want a random and suspicious ability forcibly placed inside her body. While the sage's ability might have some benefits, it also gives the sage complete control over whoever accepts it, making it a dangerous trade-off. Moko's main goal is to ensure that Danara returns to Earth safely so that she can inherit their family's martial arts techniques. Although Danara wants to return home, she knows she's currently too weak and relies heavily on Yagiri for survival. Moko promises to change that. As a spirit, Moko has access to centuries worth of martial arts knowledge, and she plans to pass that knowledge on to Danara. That night, instead of sleeping, Danara begins her intense training with Moko. The next morning, a tired and sore Danara meets Yagiri downstairs after her long night of training. She hasn't slept a wink but pretends like everything is fine. She asks Yagiri if they're planning to meet up with their classmates soon, something that's been on her mind. Yagiri replies that this is exactly what he wanted to talk to her about. Together, they meet with a woman named Celestina, who has been helping Yagiri locate his classmates. Celestina has also been gathering valuable items for them, such as language translation tools and items that conceal their status from enemies. In fact, she even made a charger for Yagiri's game console. Celestina hands them two train tickets to the capital, where she believes their classmates might be heading for training. Yagiri thanks her for all her hard work. He then asks her if she can invest the gold they stole from the returner students, to which she agrees without any hesitation. With everything in order, Yagiri and Danara board the train and continue their journey. While on the train, Yagiri suddenly senses danger. Acting quickly, he pushes Danara to the floor, narrowly avoiding a slash that tears apart their train car. It becomes clear that a battle between a sage and a massive robot, referred to as an aggressor, is happening nearby. The fight is so intense that the surrounding landscape is being reshaped by the destruction. Danara, annoyed by the constant danger, asks if Yagiri can just kill the combatants and clear the path. But Yagiri, though lethal, has his own set of rules. He won't kill someone unless there's a valid reason. Since the blast wasn't aimed directly at them, he sees no reason to kill the fighters. However, after observing the sage's rude behavior, Yagiri changes his mind and decides to kill him after all. Meanwhile, back with the vampire sage, Edelgard reports the incident involving Yagiri and the dead attackers. Despite their best efforts, they still can't figure out how the men died. They experiment on one of the surviving attackers, even going so far as to regenerate his special ability known as AI, but they still don't have any answers. The vampire sage grows frustrated and attempts to turn the man into a vampire to extract more information. But this, too, fails. Just as she's about to continue her experiments, someone bursts through the wall with a sword in hand. Back with Yagiri and Danara, the battle between the sage and the aggressor continues to rage nearby. Yagiri realizes that while they aren't the intended targets, it's still dangerous for them to stay in the area. Danara once again asks if he can just kill the combatants, but Yagiri explains that he has rules to follow. He can't kill someone simply because they are inconvenient. However, since the sage is acting rudely, Yagiri decides that killing him might not be such a bad idea after all. Elsewhere, after the sage is killed, the aggressor robot, recognizing the danger of fighting Yagiri, wisely attempts to negotiate peace. The robot has nothing of value to offer Yagiri, but Danara receives something from the encounter. Later that day, the vampire sage holds a meeting with her subordinate to discuss the dead sage found near the train tracks. 
She suspects that Yagiri might be involved and begins making plans to investigate further. Before the meeting concludes, she orders her subordinate to prepare the zombie army for their next move. After a long and perilous journey filled with relentless battles, Yagiri and Danara finally catch sight of the city of Hanabusa. It rises from the horizon like a futuristic beacon, with its towering skyscrapers and shimmering lights, looking strangely like a modern Japanese metropolis. The stark contrast between the city's sleek, high-tech appearance and the wild, untamed landscapes they had been traveling through catches both of them off guard. Danara, as always, remains bubbly and full of energy, her spirit seemingly unshaken by the miles they've covered. On the other hand, Algiri is utterly exhausted, struggling to keep pace after their long trek. His kill-death ratio has skyrocketed, leaving behind a near extinction of forest monsters and bandits along the way. He's the one who's been doing all the heavy lifting during their journey, while Danara's carefree attitude left her as more of a passive observer. As the city looms closer, Danara's mood takes a turn. Realizing how little she has contributed to their survival thus far, she apologizes to Yagiri for not being of much help. She then asks, a bit sheepishly, if he could at least give her a heads up next time they're in danger so she can avoid acting so naive and carefree. Despite her apology, she can't help but be curious about something that's been bugging her. Does the fact that Yagiri looks so tired after using his deadly abilities mean that there's a limit to how many times he can activate them? Yagiri, always calm and straightforward, reassures her with a smirk. There's no cool down on my power, he says. The developers of this world never patched it, so I'm free to spam instant death as much as I want. With that light-hearted exchange, they make their way into Hanabusa, eager to see what awaits them in the futuristic city. The bustling streets of Hanabusa are a sight to behold. Neon signs flash above their heads, the buildings glow with an otherworldly light, and advanced technology is everywhere. It's a strange fusion of modern Tokyo and some kind of futuristic utopia, making it feel both familiar and alien at the same time. They wander through the city, taking in the sights, and soon come across a luxurious hotel recommended to them by Celestina. Deciding it's best to rest and regroup, they head inside, thinking they'll finally have some time to relax. However, the moment they step into the lobby, they are greeted by an unexpected face. Takabana, one of their former classmates, is there, lounging around like he owns the place. He greets them casually, as if abandoning them in the forest to fend for themselves hadn't been a big deal at all. Danara is taken aback and immediately asks what he's doing here. As far as she knew, Takabana should still be with the rest of their class, trying to survive in the forest. Takabana, ever nonchalant, explains that he didn't agree with their inefficient methods of gaining experience. He decided to break off from the group and found something much more beneficial to himself, slavery. With a grin, Takabana introduces the members of his new harem. Erica, Stephanie, Chelsea, Euphemia, and Riza. It's an eclectic group of girls, each one different from the next, but they all share one thing in common, they hate Danner on sight. The glares they shoot her way are enough to send a chill down her spine. But Takabana doesn't seem to notice or care. He explains that after arriving in the city, he discovered that slavery is still a thing, so naturally, he took advantage of the situation. When the slavers asked how many slaves he wanted, his answer was simple, yes, Yagiri. Watching this unfold, notices Takabana's overconfidence and guesses that he must have some kind of powerful ability to back it up. Sure enough, Takabana proudly reveals that he has the class of Dominator. This allows him to control any being weaker than himself, making him a force to be reckoned with. Danara is disgusted by his arrogance, but Takabana, ever oblivious, shifts the conversation in a bizarre direction. With a straight face, he offers Danara a place in his harem, claiming that she would make a fine addition. She's left speechless by the absurdity of his proposal. When she doesn't respond, Takabana turns to Yagiri and extends the same offer to him. He assures them that if they're worried about what might happen to Yagiri, he's willing to make an exception, while he usually doesn't swing that way. He's willing to include Yagiri in his collection as well. The absurdity of the situation leaves both Yagiri and Danara stunned. Danara, trying to wrap her head around how Takabana could be so confident, asks what makes him believe he has the power to make such ridiculous demands. Takabana explains with a smug smile that after splitting from the group, he was approached by one of their classmates, Haruto, who has the class of consultant. Haruto, able to see hidden details about others' abilities, gave Takabana some valuable advice. He explained that Takabana's dominator ability wasn't just powerful, it was essentially a pyramid scheme. By buying cheap slaves and sending them out to fight for him, Takabana could earn experience points without having to do any fighting himself. Whenever his slaves won a battle, he would not only gain experience, 
but he could also dominate the defeated enemies, adding them to his growing network of slaves. Takabana's plan is simple but effective. His network of slaves is growing larger by the day, and his experience points are rising exponentially. The best part, according to him, is that he doesn't have to lift a finger. His slaves do all the dirty work while he reaps the rewards. Satisfied with his explanation, Takabana extends his offer to Danara once again, but she refuses, valuing her freedom too much. Takabana, surprisingly, agrees to leave her alone for now, giving her some time to think about it. He leaves without causing a scene, and as he walks away, Yagiri remarks that it might actually be safer for Danara to join Takabana's pyramid scheme. She'd be near the top, and with all those slaves beneath her, she wouldn't have to worry about much. However, Danra can't stomach the idea of being part of such a twisted system. Before they have time to dwell on the situation, chaos erupts in the city. A zombie army begins invading, and Danra finds herself under attack by an unseen assailant. Fortunately, Moko senses the danger and warns her just in time. Panicked, Danra calls out to Yagiri, who immediately jumps into action. Sensing the threat, he eliminates the unseen enemy with a single thought proving once again that his power is unmatched. Meanwhile, Takabana notices that one of his harem members, Erika, has suddenly died. Euphemia suggests that Erika might have been jealous of Danara and tried to take her out, but the group has little time to speculate. As they attempt to leave the hotel, Riza, one of Takabana's harem members, tries to block their path with an ice spell. However, Yagiri casually commands the ice to melt and shatters Riza's wand with ease. He warns her not to try anything sneaky or she'll meet the same fate as Erika. Terrified, Riza surrenders and hands over valuable information about the situation in the city. However, Takabana isn't ready to give up just yet. In a desperate move, he unleashes his last resort, a massive swarm of cockroaches. Though small individually, their sheer numbers pose a serious threat as they could suffocate or overwhelm their enemies. Euphemia, now concerned, urges Takabana to reconsider antagonizing someone as powerful as Yagiri. But Takabana, driven by his desire to assert dominance, refuses to back down. Yagiri, unfazed by the impending attack, identifies Takabana as the source of the killing intent and eliminates him with a single thought. With Takabana gone, the cockroach swarm vanishes as well. But the sheer number of insects leaves Yagiri and Danara no choice but to quickly vacate the room. Meanwhile, Stephanie and Euphemia, now free from Takabana's control, are left behind with his lifeless body. Euphemia, finally liberated, decides to leave the hotel, but as she reaches the surface, she is intercepted by a powerful vampire sage. The sage wastes no time, sinking her fangs into Euphemia and turning her into a vampire. Now transformed, Euphemia is compelled to divulge all the information she has about Takabana's death and the recent events. As this unfolds, Yagiri and Danara find themselves face to face with the full brunt of the zombie army that had invaded the city. In a chaotic city besieged by a zombie outbreak, the vampire sage, intrigued by the rumored power of Yagiri, wonders if his ability to bring death could end her own immortal life. Meanwhile, Euphemia, now part of her bloodline, is also affected by the turmoil. As panic grips the civilians, they face the terrifying reality of a zombie apocalypse. Yagiri and his companion, Danara, find shelter in a narrow alley, where they take a moment to plan their next move amid the pandemonium. Yagiri observes the slow-moving zombies, realizing that they have a chance to escape the city if they tread carefully. However, Danara expresses concern about the safety of the city's people. Yagiri reassures her, stating that he never aimed to be a hero. His main focus is on keeping Danara safe, showing little concern for others in the process. The mayor of the town is furious. He learns that Masayuki, the leader of the undead army, has invaded without warning and is causing harm for no good reason. Masayuki believes he has authority from a vampire named Lady Lane, which gives him the power to do whatever he wants, including hurting innocent people. He approaches Ryuta, a former friend and warrior, urging him to calm down. However, Ryuta insists that Masayuki and his undead army must leave the city immediately. Masayuki retorts that he has permission from Lady Lane to act as he wishes, including inflicting pain to search for Yagiri. Faced with the reality of Lady Lane's orders, Ryuta reluctantly hands over the key to the city. Masayuki then commands his zombies to cease their attacks and gives the citizens just one hour to deliver Yagiri and Danara, dead or alive. If they fail, he threatens to kill them all. He locks the city gates, ensuring no one can escape. The citizens, desperate to survive, rush through the streets to find the teenagers, becoming even more frantic than the zombies themselves. Amid the chaos, Danara struggles to understand why they are being hunted so intensely. Yangiri recalls that he killed a sage, which could have serious consequences. Just then, three attackers approach, ready to capture him. Yangiri warns them not to attack, but they ignore his warning and rush in. True to his word, he swiftly kills one of them, causing the others to flee in fear after witnessing his strength. 
Kagiri wonders why Masayuki believed these thugs would be effective in capturing him when he can easily overpower anyone. He suspects that Masayuki might think he has a moral code preventing him from killing innocents. But Yagiri has no such weakness. Still, he dislikes the idea of innocent people being used against him, prompting him to consider negotiating with Masayuki directly. Yagiri and Danara make their way to the town square to confront Masayuki. The air is thick with the stench of death and decay. Upon arrival, they find Masayuki irritated that he couldn't kill more people before Yagiri decided to show up. Masayuki sarcastically asks if Yagiri intends to sacrifice himself for the townspeople. Yagiri, however, has a different plan in mind. Masayuki believes he holds all the power and that Yagiri has no choice in the matter. But Yagiri proposes a deal. He asks Masayuki to remove the barrier around the city in exchange for his safe passage on a train. This suggestion angers Masayuki, who feels Yagiri has no right to ask for anything. Yagiri tries to make the deal more appealing by offering to spare Masayuki's life, despite Masayuki's cruel nature. However, Masayuki refuses and orders his undead army to attack Yagiri, convinced they are immune to his powers. Yagiri, however, calmly tells the army to die, and to Masayuki's shock, they all fall lifelessly to the ground. The smile fades from Masayuki's face as he realizes the power Yagiri wields. His immortal army is defeated in an instant, not wanting to face Yagiri's wrath. Ryuta raises his hands in surrender and betrays Masayuki. Surprisingly, Masayuki doesn't seem angry but rather confused about how something already dead could be killed again. Yagiri explains simply that while they were dead, they were still moving, and in his world, he determines what it means to be alive or dead. Masayuki, unable to accept this absurdity, begins to transform into a more powerful form to fight Yagiri. However, before he can complete his transformation, Yagiri acts swiftly and eliminates him, ensuring he doesn't stand a chance. Now, Yagiri needs to figure out how to lower the barrier around the city, but he realizes that Ryuta is willing to help him. Ryuta begs Yagiri to spare his life, but Yagiri assures him that he never intended to kill him. Ryuta explains that Masayuki, a powerful figure, received specific orders from the vampire sage named Lane to hunt down and kill Yagiri. The entire city, along with the surrounding areas, is under the control of Lane, who uses Masayuki as her subordinate to oversee everything happening in this part of the world. This situation becomes confusing for both Yagiri and Danara, who were summoned here by a sign to become sages themselves. They never expected to be hunted by another sage, which puts them in a difficult position. Just then, Moko appears before them, bringing alarming news. She informs them that there has been some sort of spiritual manipulation targeting this area. Suddenly, the citizens of the city are overtaken by an unnatural urge to kill Yagiri and Danara. This unexpected change in behavior is shocking. Ryuta realizes that if this is a spiritual attack, Perhaps the magical barrier surrounding the city can block out this hostile influence. However, when Ryuta tries to use the key to access the barrier controls, he discovers that he has been completely locked out. This means that Lane has taken control of the barrier settings and is the mastermind behind the chaos affecting the city. As Lane continues to execute her plans from a great distance away, Euphemia, her companion, expresses concern about the risks involved. She warns Lane that Yagiri has already proven his strength by killing Takabana from a long distance by tracing control over insects, specifically cockroaches. This shows that Yagiri's powers are significantly stronger than those of any sage. Euphemia suggests that it would be wiser to allow Yagiri to do as he wishes and to step back rather than provoke him. Meanwhile, the citizens, now under the influence of this mind control, begin attacking Yagiri one after another. He finds himself forced to kill them in self-defense, which weighs heavily on him. Yagiri reflects on a similar incident from his past where someone repeatedly tested his limits, trying various tactics to see how he would react. In the end, he always ended up killing those who attacked him, and he fears this situation might lead to the same tragic outcome. Ryuta is distraught as he watches his fellow citizens fall one by one before his eyes. He feels helpless as he sees the people he cares for being killed right in front of him. Outside the city, Lane continues her manipulative strategies, and the dark monster that they encountered earlier is now approaching the city. This is advantageous for Lane because it provides her with an opportunity to orchestrate Yagiri's demise without direct intent to kill him. Lane decides this is the perfect moment to set her backup plan into action. She creates several clones of herself, sending them up into the sky above the city. As the darkness arrives at the city's borders, it starts to transform everything it touches into sand, moving quickly toward the heart of the city. Lane explains that she has created these clones without any memories or knowledge of Yagiri. This means they should have no reason to attack him, as they possess no hostility toward him. She believes this tactic will ensure that Yagiri cannot use his lethal abilities against them. Lane then uses the arrival of the darkness as a cue to launch her assault, ordering her clones to bombard the city from above. 
As the darkness engulfs the city, it causes widespread destruction, tearing through buildings and leaving nothing but dust in its wake. The citizens, witnessing the chaos, feel an overwhelming sense of dread, believing that no one can stop the devastation. Yagiri feels a sense of unease about the unfolding events but knows that he cannot let the darkness kill everyone in the city. With resolve, he decides to confront the dark force. As the darkness wreaks havoc on the city, Yagiri notices the attacks, but he does not sense any specific hostility. It's as if the destruction is happening indiscriminately, which leads him to believe that someone else is controlling this chaos, testing him through the actions of the civilians. While Yagiri assesses the situation, he becomes distracted by Danara's presence, which reminds him of what he is truly fighting for. Inspired, he rises to tackle the impending threat. However, this proves to be more difficult than he anticipated, as he doesn't know exactly where the attacks are coming from. Ganera glances upward and sees something unexpected. The bombs crashing into the city are actually all clones of Lane sacrificing themselves by crashing into the ground. They come to realize that this is Lane's countermeasure against Yagiri's deadly abilities. Since she isn't targeting him directly, he finds himself in a challenging position. The clones are exploding rapidly, too fast for him to react and stop them all from causing destruction. Yagiri watches in frustration, knowing he needs to take action. Ryuta, using his mayoral abilities, surveys everything happening in the town at once. With the information he gathers, he pinpoints the next location that will be bombarded and teleports everyone to that spot just in time. As a clone is about to strike them, Yagiri anticipates the attack and eliminates it before it can do any harm. In a moment of quick thinking, Danara activates her guardian spirit, Jazz, to create a protective shield around them. This shield can serve as protective plating worn under clothing. But thanks to Moko's guardian spirit, it transforms into a versatile barrier that can take on various forms, from a simple shield to a full suit of armor. At last, Danra proves to be an asset in this chaotic fight. All of Lane's clones are ultimately defeated, and Euphemia scolds Lane, telling her that she made a grave mistake by trying to go after Yagiri. Despite the loss, Lane remains unbothered, insisting she can always create more clones to continue her assault. Just then, the full extent of Yagiri's instant death ability hits Lane like a ton of bricks, making her realize the mistake she has made. Nevertheless, she refuses to accept her impending fate and does everything in her power to avoid dying. In a different location, a little girl awakens from a nap inside a coffin. She is greeted by a pre-recorded message from Lane. In this message, Lane explains that the girl is actually a copy of her, created to exist as a separate entity. This was done as a precaution to protect against Yagiri's deadly abilities. We will revisit this later. But for now, Yagiri and Danara are preparing to leave the city, having arranged transportation with Ryuta. Meanwhile, we shift our focus to the other students and what they have been doing during this turmoil. We meet Ryako, who belongs to the samurai class. After successfully defeating a fierce monster, Ryako enters her tent, only to discover a girl named Carol standing there. Carol has taken Ryako's phone because she wanted to see the app Ryako uses to monitor their missions and activity. Yogiri and Danara, as it turns out, were both assigned the task of spying on Yogiri while they were back on Earth. As they check their monitor, they are met with horrifying news, Yogiri's first gate has been opened. Meanwhile, Danara has taken on the role of driving the jeep they're traveling in. However, it quickly becomes clear that she has absolutely no idea how to drive, almost causing an accident multiple times. She desperately wants to switch with Yagiri, but he's fast asleep, leaving her to handle things on her own. Danara, not paying attention to the road, nearly crashes into a large boulder while Yagiri enjoys a peaceful dream. In his dream, he recalls a woman from his past. The scene shifts to her story. This woman had just signed a contract for a job interview. Feeling a bit uneasy about the inclusion of a death waiver, but she was in too deep to back out now. With bills piling up, she had no choice but to go along with it. She nervously asked if this was some kind of shady organization. But her employer assured her that everything they did was mostly legal. The facility where she had been hired was involved in researching curses, and her specific task was to look after a mysterious creature. She was led down a dark, ominous red hallway and asked where they were headed. Her employer explained that her job would be to take care of a being they had named Alpha Omega. From the vague description given, Asaka wondered if this creature might be human, but her employer admitted he wasn't entirely sure, having never risked seeing the thing in person. Alpha Omega had a terrifying power, the ability to kill anything just by thinking about it. Asaka had been brought in as its teacher, tasked with controlling this incredible force, which was already dangerous enough on its own. Imagine a toddler with no concept of right or wrong, possessing this kind of power. That was where Asaka came in. As to why Asaka was chosen for such a dangerous job, it turned out she was the only one who applied. Reaching the bottom of the elevator, the employer handed her a piece of paper with instructions and wished her luck, leaving her to deal with Alpha Omega on her own. 
With no other choice, Asaka entered the room, an artificial environment designed for the creature. She nervously called out to see if anyone was there, eventually coming across a small boy at the center of the room. Initially filled with anxiety, Asaka quickly became angry upon realizing that the government had locked up a child in this underground base. She was furious at the thought of them turning this innocent boy into some kind of weapon. In a fit of determination, she dragged the boy outside, throwing him into a creek so he could play for once in his life. Yagiri. The boy seemed surprised for a moment but quickly recovered and pointed to a monster that had been lurking behind Asaka, killing it instantly. There was no clear answer as to what the creature had been, but things like that tended to show up from time to time to try and kill him. Likely, it had hidden in Asaka's shadow, but now that it was dead, there was no longer any reason to worry. Yagiri then remarked that while he would love to play, it was getting late, so they should leave that for another day. Asaka realized she might have gotten carried away with her actions and apologized finally introducing herself to the boy. More importantly, Yagiri mentioned that he was hungry, and Asaka realized that, as the adult in the room, she was responsible for taking care of him. The pantry was fully stocked, but Asaka, lacking any real cooking skills, had no idea what to make. In desperation, she settled for the classic broke college student meal, a cup of ramen. Luckily for her, Yagiri had never tasted ramen before, so he was thrilled with the simple dinner. While he ate, Asaka contemplated what name to give him, eventually deciding to name him after a dog she once had. And that's how Yagiri got his name. From that moment on, Asaka took on the role of his mother figure, caring for him as best she could. These were cherished memories for Yagiri, but his dream was abruptly interrupted when Danara yelled that the road to the capital was blocked. She was surprised that he could sleep through her reckless driving, but Yagiri couldn't help it. He was exhausted from all the zombie killing he had done back in the city. Plus, he didn't understand why they even needed to go to the capital in the first place. Their ultimate goal was to return to their original world. And to do that, they needed to find the sage, Snan. Even if they didn't go to the capital, there should be other ways to find her. With that in mind, they decided to turn around and look for another route past the mountain. As Danara backed up, she accidentally bumped into something. It turned out to be a dragon that had been standing behind them. They got out of the jeep to assess the situation, but the dragon attacked immediately, leaving Yagiri no choice but to kill it. Unfortunately, this wasn't the only dragon. An entire flock appeared, ready to burn them to ashes. However, the dragons were no match for Yagiri, who quickly wiped them all out. They had just decimated an entire population of dragons in their own territory. It was as if Yagiri had shown up and committed mass genocide in their front yard. But the battle wasn't over yet, as a golden thunder dragon soon arrived on the scene. Unlike the others, this dragon didn't seem to have any killing intent toward them, so Yagiri saw no reason to harm it. After a few moments, the golden dragon spoke, telling them they could pass before attempting to fly away quickly, fearing for its own life. Sensing an opportunity, Yagiri called the dragon back, threatening to kill it if it didn't return. The dragon, now in the form of a little girl, complied. Danara was shocked to see the massive creature transform into a small girl but brushed off the details for the time being. Yagiri asked the girl the important question. Why had the dragons attacked them in the first place? The girl explained that the dragons had been testing whether Yagiri was worthy of meeting the Swordmaster. Yagiri, however, had no idea who this Swordmaster was. The dragon couldn't believe they had come all this way without intending to meet the master. But Yagiri and Danara were simply trying to reach the capital. There was no reason to make a detour. Nevertheless, the dragon pleaded with them to follow her to the Swordmaster, as her job was to bring promising individuals to him. After losing her entire dragon army, she couldn't return empty-handed. The Swordmaster was supposedly on equal footing with a sage, so Yagiri decided it might be worth meeting him. After all, the Swordmaster could have valuable information about how they could return to their original world, and they were stuck here for the time being anyway. The dragon, Attila, promises Yagiri and Danara that if they accompany her to meet the Swordmaster, she will personally guide them to the capital. Upon arriving at the Swordmaster's location, they see a crowd of people who, like them, have come to meet the Swordmaster, all hoping for a chance to become the next Divine King. One man grumbles, thinking it must be against the rules to arrive by car, as everyone else had to walk. But the Swordmaster, surprisingly, has no issue with it. However, the Swordmaster's kindness is deceiving. As soon as he arrives, his first order of business is for the participants to kill each other until less than half remain. Yagiri, who had no desire to be there in the first place, asks if he can leave, since he refuses to participate. But the Swordmaster then makes up a rule that no one is allowed to escape, and the carnage begins as the participants start slaughtering one another. Some people target Yagiri, but before he has to defend himself, someone steps in to protect both him and Danara. 
This mysterious man, Rick, seems genuinely decent, though he praises the Swordmaster a bit too much. He claims the Swordmaster doesn't really want them to kill each other and that it was probably just a test to see if they'd dishonor themselves. However, Yagiri notices some magicians in the background casting a dangerous spell, so he neutralizes them immediately. Rick, still singing the Swordmaster's praises, suggests that the Swordmaster must have killed the magicians for acting dishonorably. During the chaos, they notice a man, Lionel, who had been bisected but was somehow still alive. Lionel asks Danner to place a rainbow-colored stone in his hand. She reluctantly does so, and the moment he holds the gem, his body is miraculously restored. Satisfied with the bloodshed for now, the Swordmaster orders the fighting to stop and instructs everyone to follow him as the test continues elsewhere. Attila pleads with Yagiri to keep going through with the trial, hoping he'll become the next Divine King so that she can get promoted to his attendant. Since Yagiri and Danara haven't gathered any useful information yet, they reluctantly decide to continue for now, though it's becoming more of a nuisance than they expected. As they follow the Swordmaster, Rick properly introduces himself, and Lionel shares his story about the Rainbow Stone. Yagiri then asks what the big deal is about becoming the Divine King. Rick explains that the Divine King was the one who sealed away the Dark God long ago. Although the Dark God is sealed, there are still many people trying to revive him, which keeps him a constant threat. In the back, Danara questions Lionel about the mysterious healing stone. Lionel explains that the stones can heal serious injuries and are also used in various games. Due to his terrible luck, Lionel often ends up in dire situations, such as being sacrificed by a weird cult. He was sure he was going to die, but a goddess appeared and apologized for his misfortunes by giving him these stones, which he now uses to survive. He can even trade them for random items. Though with his bad luck, he usually ends up with useless things, like a brush. He mentions that the crystals replenish at midnight, depending on how bad his luck was that day. As the group continues forward, they are led into a barrier that transports them to the base of a huge tower. Attila is left behind, as it appears only those participating in the trial can enter. Inside the tower, they ascend to the top, where the Swordmaster shows them a powerful seal created by the last Divine King. The seal holds hundreds of monsters and the Dark God within it. Danara notices a girl in the middle of the seal, repeatedly stabbing herself alongside the Dark God. Another participant, Frederica, attempts to launch an attack to finally kill the Dark God, but the barrier around the seal slows down time. It could take hundreds of years for her attack to land. Danara wonders aloud if Yagiri's power would work against the Dark God, even with the time delay. Yagiri, however, seems troubled. He has a personal rule, he doesn't kill unless there's a good reason. But with all the commotion around them, something had felt off, and Yagiri had acted on instinct. As it turns out, he had already killed the Dark God within the time bubble without fully realizing it. Yagiri, having effectively rendered the entire trial pointless by killing the Dark Lord without anyone noticing, wants to leave before anyone figures out what he's done. Just as they're about to make their escape, Lionel hears his name called out by the entitled girl who had dragged him into the competition in the first place. She storms over, demanding that he hand over some of his apology gems to replenish her mana. Though Lionel complies, he warns her that the gems only work for him, which seems to fall on deaf ears as she grabs one and marches off. With that little interruption out of the way, the team finally gets moving again. Due to the delay, it turns out that the other participants who went ahead have already triggered most of the traps in the tower, involuntarily clearing the way for Yagiri and his group. Now, all they need to do is avoid the remaining traps, which seems easy enough, except for the fact that Lionel's terrible luck is about to make things complicated. Almost immediately after Rick warns everyone to proceed cautiously, he steps on a hidden magic circle and gets his chest impaled by a massive spike. Thankfully, Rick still has some apology gems left, which allow him to heal from the life-threatening injury, much to the group's relief. Given how frequently Rick has been injured, Danara suggests that he just keep one of the apology crystals in his hand at all times, ready to use at a moment's notice. Now feeling confident that he's prepared for anything, Rick rushes into an unexplored room on his own. Unfortunately, the blood-curdling scream that follows suggests that this was not a wise decision. When the rest of the group catches up, they find Rick facing a woman named Teresa, standing in the middle of a blood-soaked room. Rick is utterly shocked to see her, as she was once a highly respected knight of the Divine King. However, Teresa's ruthless nature had eventually led to her being stripped of her title, as she had a habit of killing anyone and everyone she could, simply for her own twisted enjoyment. Now, with no other occupation, Teresa has joined the competition to become the next Divine King, relishing the chance to kill as many people as possible along the way. Rick tells the others to run, but Danara notices that the room is filled with thin, nearly invisible wires. She quickly realizes that these are traps, designed to slice anyone who tries to escape. Teresa impressed by Danara's ability to spot the traps before falling into them, smirks and makes it clear that her intention is to kill every last one of them. 
Rick steps forward, determined to protect the group. He readies himself for battle, telling Yogiri, Danara, and Lionel to find a way out while he holds Teresa off. Teresa, however, is clearly toying with him, striking at him with razor-sharp threads that slice through the air. Rick manages to hold his ground, but Danara can see that Teresa is still holding back, which makes the situation all the more dangerous. If Teresa truly gets serious, Rick might not be able to keep up. However, before things can escalate any further, Yagiri casually tells Teresa to shut up. In that instant, she drops dead on the spot, her life snuffed out without any further drama. With Teresa out of the picture, the group takes a moment to catch their breath. They suddenly remember that Lionel had been with them earlier, and when they look around, they find his severed hand lying on the ground. It's bad luck that his hand, holding the apology crystal, was the part of him that got chopped off, but at least Lionel is still alive, albeit in a much rougher condition than before. After regrouping, the team continues downward and finally makes it to the 998th floor of the tower, where they are informed that this area serves as a safe zone. It's a place where they can rest without fear of being attacked, and there are even rooms provided for them. Yagiri, tired from all the chaos, suggests they split up for a while to take a break and do their own things. Rick agrees with the idea but checks to make sure Yagiri and Danara will be alright by themselves. They assure him that they'll be fine, and Lionel, exhausted and completely out of apology gems for the day, agrees as well. Knowing that if he leaves the safe zone, he could die for real this time, Lionel plans to barricade himself for survival. With everyone in agreement, Rick heads off on his own, leaving the rest of the group to settle down. Yagiri then asks Danner if she would like to rest for a bit, but there's an awkward moment when they discover there's only one room available. This situation understandably makes Danner a bit nervous, especially since Moko is still watching over them. However, Moko reassures her that she doesn't mind, much to Danner's embarrassment. Yagiri, seemingly oblivious to the awkwardness, wastes no time changing his clothes and preparing to sleep. Despite the tension, his only focus is getting some much-needed rest after everything they've been through. Meanwhile, midnight finally arrives, and Lionel, who had nearly died more times than he could count that day, receives his next batch of apology gems. He's thrilled to see that he's been given 100 apology gems, along with a guaranteed ultra-rare stone. Feeling lucky for once, Lionel eagerly goes for the stone pull, hoping for a powerful weapon or armor that could turn his luck around. However, instead of something useful for battle, he ends up summoning a woman. At first, Lionel thinks he's hit the jackpot, but to his surprise, the woman turns out to be the goddess who brought him into this world. Rather than joining him on some grand adventure, the goddess is simply checking in to see if he's still alive. She also updates his save point, ensuring that no matter how many times he dies, he'll always respawn in the safe zone. Once her task is complete, the goddess promptly vanishes, leaving Lionel alone once again, much to his frustration. He had been hoping for something a bit more exciting. But now he's left with nothing but his thoughts and a quiet night ahead. In the tower's control center, the homunculus girl approaches the master with unsettling news. Their calculations reveal a discrepancy between the number of souls the tower has collected and the actual number of people who have died. Despite this, the master is unconcerned, as they still have enough souls to sustain the barrier that seals the Dark Lord. He seems more focused on another pressing issue. They need to replenish their stock of half-demons, who are essential for powering the barrier. Meanwhile, far from the tower, a blue-haired girl races through a field as explosions erupt around her. She mutters about how rude it is to be attacked without even being asked what she wants. However, her attacker already knows why she's there, to recruit him. The girl, named AI, was indeed tasked with recruiting him, but she was also given orders to kill anyone who refuses, to make sure she's targeting the right person. AI uses her powers to scan him. The man, Seidu, had used his gift to build a peaceful colony where he could live in solitude, away from the chaos. He isn't willing to let AI disrupt his life, so he launches an attack, summoning a swarm of tentacles to restrain her. Unfortunately for him, AI's powers are too advanced, and his abilities are rendered useless. Realizing that his tentacles won't work, Seidu draws his sword, a powerful weapon immune to AI's abilities. But AI skillfully evades his strikes and effortlessly puts him at knife point before slitting his throat. As Seidu's body falls, AI's talking knife informs her that her next mission is already waiting. She's to head to the city of Hanabusa and eliminate another target. Frustrated that she doesn't get a moment to rest, she prepares to leave. But before she can go, she encounters a familiar face, Hanakawa. Somehow, he managed to survive for weeks in the forest and was taken in by Seidu, who allowed him to stay in the colony. Now that AI has killed Seidu, Hanakawa has no protection left. Desperate, he begs her to take him with her back to where Yagiri and Danara are. Back in the tower, Danara is still asleep when Mocha calls out, urging her to wake up. Danara opens her eyes, only to find Yagiri's face buried in her talons, though it's clear he's still fast asleep and unaware of the situation. 
However, Mocha didn't wake her up because of this, she's in trouble herself. Mocha had been watching them sleep earlier and, mistakenly assuming some romantic encounter was about to happen, tried to leave. But curiosity got the better of her, and as she peeked in, she found herself trapped by a mechanism in the wall that's designed to capture spirits. When Yagiri wakes up, he asks if there's anything he can do to help. But Danara, resigned to the situation, thanks Mocha for all the time they've spent together. It seems Mocha is about to be lost forever. However, Yagiri steps forward, calmly locating the mechanism, and disables it. Miraculously, Mocha is freed. She breathes a sigh of relief, still amazed that she's managed to survive despite being dead for centuries. The group ponders why the tower is capturing spirits, but they don't have an answer. After everything that has happened, Yagiri warns Danara that from now on, he will eliminate anyone who poses even the slightest threat. Danara agrees, grateful for his unwavering protection, which makes Yagiri blush. Meanwhile, AI and Hanakawa approach the tower, only to be confronted by a massive dragon. Hanakawa immediately suggests they flee, but AI dismisses the idea. She casually remarks that a dragon that size shouldn't even be able to fly. As if on cue, the dragon plummets to the ground. AI's ability doesn't just deal forceful impacts, it warps reality to align with her belief. The only limitation is that her powers don't work on individuals with extraordinary luck. Despite the dragon's fall, it remains a dangerous threat, but it is quickly decapitated by an unknown figure. The group watches as this mysterious person gathers information from the dragon before heading into the tower's barrier. Determined to follow, AI drags a reluctant Hanakawa along with her. Inside the tower, Yagiri and Danara continue to progress through the many challenges set before them. However, their advancement angers the tower's creator, Iglesia, who decides to personally intervene. Iglesia explains that the tower was built to maintain the barrier, which seals away the Dark Lord. If the tower is destroyed, the Dark Lord will be released. Iglesia cannot allow this to happen and insists that they stop their actions. Unfazed, Yagiri offers a simple solution. They'll stop if Iglesia lets them go. But Iglesia, unwilling to negotiate, prepares to retaliate. Before she can act, Yagiri kills her in an instant with a mere word, eliminating the threat before it even materializes. With Iglesia gone, Yagiri and Danara continue their journey through the tower. Along the way, they stumble upon a large stadium where two swordsmen are locked in combat, while a man named Masaki lounges arrogantly on a throne. Masaki, who carried the throne with him throughout the tower, watches the battle with a self-satisfied smirk. One of the fighters, a girl battling a rabbit-like creature, is revealed to be a half-demon. Yagiri, uninterested in the ongoing duel, simply requests that Masaki allow them to pass through peacefully. Masaki, however, refuses and demands a fight. Undeterred, Yagiri swiftly eliminates not only Masaki but his entire group of servants. Impressed by Yagiri's power, the half-demon girl asks to join their group. Together, they continue their journey, stronger than before. Thanks for watching till this long my fellow men of culture. Don't forget to tell us about your favorite waifu from this anime and subscribe to the channel for more content.